Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon and thank you for being with us for the second online conference for MSF uh, Foundation. This time our guest is with us and that's really pleasing to have with us Karen Akoka, who is a sociologist because of uh, the publication of her book, Asile Exil, which is a history on uh, the difference between refugees and migrants. We have an hour and a half of discussion with her. She's a researcher at the Institut des Sciences Sociales Politiques, and she's a fellow at Convergence Migration. She's worked for some years at HCR, UNHCR, which is uh, certainly the experience which is at uh, the basis of uh, what she's going to talk about today. She's also led a project called Babels with uh, Michel Agier and Stéphane Le Local, which resulted in the uh, publishing of seven books uh, published by Le Passager Clandestin, which uh, deals with uh, migration and migrants living in city, to which have uh, contributed a certain number of MSFers. And I'm very pleased to have her with us today because her book has been very useful in understanding migration patterns and uh, uh, feed our um, project with uh, migrants. So we met in 2015-2016 at the time when MSF was uh, starting again some missions in France with uh, migrants. And uh, we thought that it was more than high time to um, make this better known to a broader audience. Why in 2015, uh, 2015 was uh, 16, sorry, was it so important to rely on this work? And why did we meet at that time? Well, because in 2015 and since 2015, part of the debate in the public arena regarding migration in Europe is also about how to uh, qualify these migrants. Are they r refugees? who will enjoy protection by the international conventions or European conventions on refugees, or are these uh, so-called economic migrants that are uh, to be uh, sent back home? And in her book, and, and what she's going uh, to uh, tell us today, and based on the history of OFPRA, which is the French Office for the Protection of Stateless and Refugees, She's showing how these definitions of refugees and migrants are uh, based on uh, power relations. So based on a uh, history of uh, public law, uh, she uh, tells us on how this has been uh, qualified. I forgot to switch on my microphone, says Karen. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to all of you, and I'm very pleased to be with you, and uh, it's really sad that we're not all in the same room. So indeed, I make the difference between the migrant and refugee, even though the migrant refugees are considered are, as more legitimate than migrants. And in my opinion, it was very important to uh, challenge this uh, difference between both because Today, is, uh, it is considered as uh, self-evident, and it is also at the heart of all the migration policies for the last uh, 30 years, and it's also part of a, what we have in our mind when we think about uh, migration. It seemed to me that it was urgent and important to tackle this and explain that refugees and migrants are not the same that in there are so-called two categories of people, and then there's one category that is that of refugees, which would mean more legitimate than the others. Um, this is what I uh, try to explain and show that our uh, policies over the last uh, three decades uh, 
have have made a fictitious difference because it does not reflect uh, the sociological um, history of people who uh, go on the road and that these uh, individual histories are far more complex than these two categories. And these two categories make the difference between political and economic aspect and forced migration and uh, voluntary uh, uh, migration and collective or individual migration. And all these uh, dichotomies, all these differences are very artificial because when you run away from poverty, is it your own will? Is it in an individual migration, not part of collective migration? Running away from economic uh, a plight uh, and from an economic standpoint, isn't that also a political um, migration? So these are some um, dichotomies. My book is 360 pages in French, so I'll try to summarize it. So these categories have been invented to put some order in social life, but also uh, it's meant a political order. And uh, if I take again the um, opposition between economic uh, refugees or uh, political refugees, it is said that migration is uh, voting with your feet, so it's political. So here again, there's a whole literature. Carl Poliani has demonstrated that this fiction of two separate spheres, the economic one and the political one, are a part of liberal uh, or free market economy, so it doesn't have any sense from the sociological standpoint. So my book starts in 2015, as Michael has explained, when Al Jazeera said that uh, there was a need to stop uh, uh, calling people uh, swimming across the Mediterranean uh, migrants because they were dehumanized. So that's uh, also the time when we, there was the picture of uh, Ailan who uh, died on a uh, this uh, small uh, child who died on a uh, on the road of migration and uh, all journalists at that time, further to what Al Jazeera said, wondered whether they were migrants or refugees. And my question, which is the most important one, to me is not whether they're refugees or migrants or why migrants should be turned into refugees or people individually who've uh, taken the roots of exile be considered as refugees. Is it more severe to die in a prison because of political reason or die from hunger? And eventually, this is the main question uh, that uh, feeds or informs my investigation. I've decided to focus on OFPRA, which is uh, the French organization which uh, makes a sorting between migrants and refugees. So it's a sociological and historical overview of what I call the labeling of people. And I've worked on the uh, archives of OFPRA uh, from uh, the 1950s up to today, and I've interviewed other people. And then I've done an eth ethnographic review of what OFPRA is doing today with uh, interviews with the, uh, its workers. And uh, I've also reviewed my own work because I worked for the uh, UNHCR before I was uh, a scholar. And I was involved in actually sorting people between refugees and migrants. And this is, as Michael said, uh, has uh, led me into this uh, uh, crazy work. No, this uh, long or longitudinal work is not here by coincidence. I think it's important to remind that to deconstruct uh, what is uh, shown as uh, being self-evident uh, is uh, not so true. And to repeat what Pierre Bourdieu said, who said, and I quote, uh, that working on Genesis is also a way to uh, develop a practical utopia because uh, thinking the present as it is, it might lead you to think that the future might be different because the past was also different. So 
in order to deconstruct this history, uh, we have an extraordinary breakthrough because the period from 1950 to the 1980s, 1990s, uh, shows uh, very little about uh, this history. For a long time, the archives were not available. And also, up until the 1980s, 1990s, 80 people of asylum seekers were granted the refugee status. So it was nothing to be reported about it. Uh, everything was uh, doing fine and smooth and uh, nothing. But I will try to demonstrate that uh, it leads us to see this uh, 30 years uh, with a different eye, because we all have mi misconceptions about that. Another thing that I wanted to work on is that our uh, policies on migrants are based on a, a misconception of this uh, 30 years. So this reversal, when 80% of people who were granted the status meant that there was a, a downturn where only 20% of people were granted the refugee status for three uh, reasons. The first one is that the uh, profile of asylum seekers has changed, so they were no longer genuine asylum seekers. Second reason, which is that uh, this organization, which was uh, uh, independent, is no longer independent, so the proceedings are now in the, uh, in the hand of the organization, so, called, so that's another so-called reason. And the third reason is that uh, the Geneva Convention is obsolete uh, and uh, does not uh, cover today's reality. I disagree with all these proposals, these three suggested reasons, because uh, they are shaping the way we uh, see our migration policies today. And uh, my understanding is different. So, and I will tell you uh, what has happened uh, between the 1950s and the th uh, 30s, so that you are convinced by my analysis. So the first thing which was uh, uh, related to the uh, distinction is also based on the definition of a refugee. The definition of, of refugee has changed over time. There is no such thing as a refugee by essence. And when you see that this definition has changed, you saw that the construction is wrong. And uh, this construction is only based on power relations and uh, the interests of uh, some political trends and parties between the two world wars, the definition of a refugee is a collective definition. The refugees were the Russians. And this is a definition which was given by the League of Nations. They were the Russians and then the Armenians. And in the 1920s, the Italians were not considered as refugees based on the League of Nations definition. So when we understand what happened at that time, well, for the main countries of the League of Nations, they were afraid of the Russian, the Bolshevik revolution, so that uh, qualifying Russians as refugees is a way to fight against uh, the Bolsheviks. And fascism was not a problem at that time. And uh, the uh, paradigm is that for uh, German Jews to be considered as refugees, we had to wait till 1938. So that it was very late, because it is only in 1938 that the League of Nations had stopped to try and uh, a dialogue with Hitler. And that's when the uh, German Jews were considered as refugees. So the definition of refugees has changed quite a lot. Uh, because of political reasons. What about our modern definition uh, from the 1951 Geneva Convention, which uh, should be uh, 
celebrated in its anniversary this year. So uh, refugees, a victim of persecution for political uh, reasons, namely, but this definition was adopted in the early days of the Cold War and has led to uh, endow people with a protection. Those people were fleeing from the communist countries. But the social and economic violence was never mentioned. It was qualified as inequality. So it is a, a heritage from the democratic free market economies who consider that political rights uh, are more uh, that these rights were more important than other rights. That's why it was also accepted by the USSR at that time. And hopefully you've uh, understood that from this uh, journey between definitions, a uh, redefinition of a refugee tells us far more about those who qualify the definition rather than how refugees or people see themselves. So when you go into all the details and you try to understand why people have left, uh, when, when they left, You'd better look also at the organization qualifying them as refugees or migrants. And when you do that, one realizes that these are arbitrary and political definitions. But it's not only about definitions. No, back to the Geneva Convention, which is the definition we use today to qualify migrants and refugees. You realize that this uh, definition is enforced in different ways depending on the period, uh, the power relation, the diplomatic relations, etc. So, so by focusing on OFPA, the French institution, and based on my interview, on the interviews and uh, the archives review, I've uh, made identified two period from the 1950s to the 1980s with no clear cut period, uh, which is the un not so well known period where the uh, status of refugee is almost systematically granted to people coming from the uh, communist countries, from Eastern European countries and uh, from Laos, uh, Vietnam. So when you look at the archive, people are not asked to demonstrate that they've been individually persecuted or persecuted or victims of persecutions. And even when uh, they have arrived for economic reasons, they were granted the refugee status. And for those who came from uh, the French Indochine, Without any interview, just based on a form that they had to fill out, they were given the uh, uh, status. The asylum seekers were coming from, and those who were, sorry, those who were instructing their cases were also from their home countries. They are foreigners. They do not have any French uh, nationality. They were refugees themselves. They've uh, fled uh, the same and ran away from the same regime. They speak the same language and they write on the, the documents of OFPA in their own language. And one is quite surprised to uh, discover these papers are written in Russian or Hungarian or Polish. So very high height, uh, rate of uh, uh, people who are granted the uh, the status. And then those who have kept some uh, bonds or links with their home country and who've traveled too many times to their home countries uh, are deprived of this status. Or of uh, those who've had a uh, um, uh, perpetrated crime or whatever. So this uh, refugee status is uh, quite different from the definition we have today. And I've called it a form, a controlled form of no control. No. If these OFPRA workers were working this way, well, it helped uh, during this period of the Cold War to uh, deprive the uh, communist regime of any legitimacy because it was the most important challenge in the Cold War. So the border between migrant and refugee is based on ideology. That is the iron curtain on separating two worlds. And 
Not only that, this border is the uh, Iron Curtain, but also it all depends on diplomatic relations. And this is visible uh, when you look at those who were not granted uh, refugee status or who were not given even the right to ask for it. Some people from Portugal, from Greece, Yugoslavia, even though it was a communist country, some Spanish people had many more difficulties in being granted this refugee status. And it's very visible in the OFPRA document at the board uh, minutes, uh, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says we shouldn't be granting too many uh, Portuguese people f with uh, this uh, status because we will have some problems in our diplomatic relation with the Salazar's regimes. So what do we do not to uh, have them uh, leave the deported. So, uh, Portuguese people who came to Ofpra said, well, there is no asylum for Portuguese people, but there are migration procedures. And indeed, those people who are not considered or not desired as refugee, they are very desired in, as uh, migrants. So very uh, quickly, they were given a work permit and, and those who came from Yugoslavia. So in order not to have too many Yugoslavians, we uh, signed uh, labor uh, secondment uh, agreements with uh, Yugoslavia. People fled from Yugoslavia, had a work permit to work in France based on this uh, bilateral agreement between the two countries. And that's why the rates were so high. So there is this uh, definition based on the Iron Curtain, the diplomatic relations, and also political matters. It's quite striking to see that uh, no communist was ever recognized as a refugee. At that time, when the Spaniards were uh, recognized as refugees is when uh, there was some tension between France and Spain. But there were no communists above them. They were all socialists or anarchists. Same thing for the Portuguese. At one point, some were granted the refugee status when the relations between France and Portugal were not so, long, so good. And so none of them were communists while well, they were opponents. So what the, the communists do, well, they avoid uh, the asylum uh, proceedings, so they just migrated, and they would uh, disguise themselves as migrants. Quite often there were intellectuals, they would disguise themselves as uh, farmers or, or, or factory workers to uh, cross the border or they uh, come to Ofpra, but they don't disclose that they were communists. So they, if they were well known in their countries, it would have meant that they would have had some problems because the uh, Spaniards workers at Ofpra were uh, anarchist or socialist, but they were not communists. So there's truly an identification relation between those who are uh, seeking asylum and those granting them the status. So they are desirable as refugees because there is a political benefit. And when they are not desirable, uh, then they are, um, they will go through the migration procedure or they will have to go back to their home countries. And as from the 1990s, only 20% of the asylum seekers were granted refugee status. With the same Geneva Convention, the same text, because it is a very vague text which can be uh, used very differently depending on the interests. So the interpretation of the convention is that uh, individual uh, persecution is to be considered. It's a new interpretation of the Geneva Convention because it doesn't show in the convention. And this has been uh, also uh, factored in the French law on migration. So. Uh, there are many more demands regarding asylum seekers. They have to demonstrate that they've been individually victims of persecution, that uh, they should provide evidence about that. Uh, all their narratives are being uh, screened, as you know, because uh, it's more often talked about today for people from uh, 
Yugoslavia and Algeria, we invent uh, in an interpretation of the Geneva Convention. So you cannot be uh, granted the um, status if you are persecuted or victim of persecution by a non-state organization. For the Kurdish people, as from the 1980s, they will have to demonstrate that they were de individually victims as Kurdish. So at the same time, they shouldn't have been fighters. So all the Kurdish people who are coming to Ofpra have to lie and uh, will not disclose that there were PKK members. And much later, with the Tamil uh, from Sri Lanka, they will have to uh, conceal the fact that they were a part of the LTTE. So it's almost a contradiction uh, for an individual uh, not to be involved uh, while being involved and conceal the political involvement. So based on these uh, very stringent and sometimes contradictory demands, we enter in a vicious circle that we still uh, live with today is that uh, there is so much request on um, a demand and stringent. So there is a lot of fraud and uh, there is a lack of supervision and monitoring and it causes even more fraud, etc. So what has happened since then? A new policy which is at the crossroad of uh, macro changes, that is the end of the Cold War. So the new unified uh, uh, liberal free market economy, migration is constructed intellectually as a problem, but that's another issue. So the uh, policies that are therefore aimed at reducing the number of migrants and uh, there is the welfare state, welfare state is in a so-called crisis, that there is austerity uh, on budgets and therefore uh, foreigners uh, are not granted the same rights as in the past and uh, they are considered as assisted people just like the unemployed. And there is an increasing number of people uh, seeking asylum uh, coming from African, North African countries or um, former French colonies where France still maintains some influence. And um, we don't want to have problems with the dictators of those countries. There is a whole chapter that is written on this book on asylum seekers from uh, Zaire, from DRC. And it raises the problem of the relation between the ministry, French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the uh, DRC uh, government. Now, we've seen that political prerequisites are also uh, connected to uh, HR uh, policy policies. So it's also about the way we want to uh, organize things in the OFPRA. So for people from Laos, Cambodia, you have people from those countries. And for the people from Zaire or DRC, uh, there are French people uh processing their cases and this does have a direct influence on the organization and completely changed the profile of the ofpra workers well, this rigor and this influence and it is applied to all the nationalities and so the agents at the uh, at the ofpra uh, and uh, often they don't speak French and often they have very far off origins of certain countries, but they no longer have a right to work and to, to, uh, to, to care for the group in question. And that's the first question uh, of human resources. In the beginning of the 1990s, uh, there was also the, the, the cord of the, the, of the, of the opera. Because in the beginning of the 1990s, they're saying that there are too many bodies uh, to uh, over this thing. They, they tried to reduce the, the number of organisms which were in charge of that. And so uh, they created this core of the uh, public function that made uh, OFPRA an institution but uh, full of uh, bureaucrats uh, after a while. 
And these agents uh, segmented, uh, uh, divided up their tasks they have to do. And they they initially handled the uh, the uh, asylum seekers and then uh, re refugees in a different department. And little by little, they they increased. And it was uh, it, and there only remained in the end the asylum seekers. And so it was no longer to try and uh, incorporate them into society, but to filter them rather to keep them out. After having examined all these uh, slow changes uh, in many aspects of the OFPRA, uh, a question which, which I was asking myself, and I imagine you are too, uh, today, how is, there is, how, how is this uh, political segmentation has come about? And, uh, and what, uh, how does it manifest itself? In several ways, it's, it, it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very easy to do because there are no records uh, from the past from the, up until the 1980s. And the, the, in, in the way that the people present themselves, and so there are many things we don't know just because of a lack of records and historical uh, documents. It, it also uh, comes up with uh, upstream of OFPRA upstream of the borders, of the impossibility of, of crossing the borders and the uh, border controls, uh, even with the, uh, the policies of Dublin, uh, they exist uh, more broadly than just at the moment of distinction between a refugee and, and, uh, and a migrant. Now, if you examine the institution itself, it materializes in a way which is much more invisible. That is a form uh, of, in the form of, of the introduction uh, in the institution of, of management methods, uh, the new uh, management budget. And, and so they create new uh, management norms uh, that occur to all the institutions today, not just OPRA. And this idea, for example, they have to produce and you have to, uh, to, to be accountable for what they produce. And today, for example, we don't say to the agent, the agent so much the, with the decisions they have to make. They are told, they are left, they are apparently left, uh, they are left with a certain autonomy. On the other hand, they say they, they dictate the rhythm at which they have to work. Uh, and there have to be six uh, interviews per day, for example, uh, for, and then to be, they have to respect all of these indications to be able to receive bonuses and things, for example. And so it's guaranteed by a whole system of sanctions and, uh, and, and bonuses for there, for there to be renewed as bureaucrats. Uh, there has there, a decision was made to be to accord a refugee status. It re requires enormous amount of work. A, a, a lot of evidence has to be produced to be able to to pass by the, by the various rankings uh, after they've been defined. It's the it's the reverse. The director for it's, it, what nowadays is reverse of what it was in the 1980s which may seem self-evident to you, but in fact, it's not one. Uh, the, the director has a completely different role than he did four, uh, 50 years ago. In, in the, in the product, uh, productivist uh, frame of mind, uh, there are symbolic things that go against the standards, and they create their own statutes. It costs a lot of money uh, to be able to create status, and in this productivist frame of mind, we understand better why the supreme objective is uh, it, it permits to be able to reject many more cases, which is uh, proper to the managerial pro productivity. The neo-managerial uh, uh, policies uh, that I found in the OFRA, and I work from that angle, the, the principle of standardization and uh, e effectiveness, segmentation of tasks. So, uh, I'm, 
the 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 principle of effectiveness uh, is very typical of pr pr productivism and the standardization makes it possible to uh, to resume on the individual work uh, of the agents and the pr professionalization means that the organization closes in on itself and it, and we see we see associations and to the the outside world but it's a kind of a it's a closing up because they are uh, they are demanding the monopoly of know-how and the segmentation of tasks which we see with the opera uh, more and more nowadays it creates a reduction of the professional uh, territory of the professionals and it permits a much a greater control of the uh, records and even if it allows for the dilution of the links of cause and effect between the fact of, of, uh, of, of giving a rejection, and this makes it possible to detach when the, when the task is segmented, we realize less about the effect of the decision. But uh, at the heart of the setup, there is the, the, there is the guidance of, this, of these objectives, of this uh, new managerial policy, uh, and rejections become the rule, and the, the acceptances become the exception, just the dead opposite to, to uh, 40 years ago. So in the end, the other thing which is at the heart of the contemporary production of rejections, it's also, uh, there's a lot of discursive uh, work, uh, narrative on to protect the uh, asylum. Uh, we, have to we have to limit it. It has to be, it has to be muted. As uh, I've tried, uh, I, I, I call that the protecting the asylum of those who are asking for it or, or limit it. And so, so, so it's a whole narration that we also hear more broadly nowadays, even more and more, which also enables this uh, productivity. And uh, I think uh, with the paradox with the asylum, uh, uh, the, the asylum is uh, the, 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 the former uh, asylum seekers have become uh, the, the bureaucrats in the association. The paradox comes, uh, it's an establishment which is, is led to its own restrictions. In other words, it becomes so highly placed that nobody can reach it anymore. And the glorification of asylum is by, by, by restricting it, by, by purifying. And I can come back to that a little bit later if you want to through your questions. And it's uh, in fact it's, it's it's become so closed that nobody can uh, to reach it. So the three interpretations which I gave you in the beginning by saying today we explain this difference between 1980s and nowadays, because the pro the profile of the uh, asylum seekers has changed, and also the uh, the conventions of Geneva have become obsolete. These three explanations have something in common that is they look at the 1950s and 60s, which I've already talked about, as a kind of a golden age. Uh, that the re the refugee agents were doing the work, and they were they were according a lot of, and they were granting a lot of uh, uh, asylum and refugee asylum, uh, and be uh, always in reference to the Geneva Conventions. And I think that, that the, ex the examination into this uh, long period of time, uh, all of that has to do. There there's no uh, there's no end to Ofra. Uh, Ofra was in reality never completely independent. When you work on asylum, uh, uh, the, this we consider an important talk. When you see 80% uh, grants for uh, for refugee status, we also have to be careful when examining these things to try not to project ourselves on the facts themselves. Uh, our, our own personal political opinions, and 80% 80, 80 doesn't mean that the, the agency was independent. It was never independent. And so, in fact, yesterday, the political priorities, that is the su subordination to diplomatic, uh, diplomatic and political conditions, has led to interpret the uh, Geneva Conventions in a very flexible way and to produce a lot of agreements. The, the policy of asylum is subordinated to the redu reduction of flows of migrants. <laughs> 
and is contributing to, to a, a lot of a big a large number of refusals there is a, tr a transformation of the subordination and has produced different effects and, and there is no uh, change in the profile of the uh, the asylum seekers there are a lot of periods where uh, the pr the asylum seekers did change profiles but if the, the the Bolsheviks, for example, in the early part of the century, or or when the boat people came, it was a completely different profile. But if there is a constant in all this, to say that there's a change in profile, yes, of course, there's always a, a change in the profile of the of the immigrants of the migrants, but it doesn't explain about the transformation of between the the granting of uh, of asylum in uh, the 1980s and the refusal of it now. And the Geneva Convention isn't obsolete. I hope you've understood. It's just a very vague text, and it can be interpreted in many different ways according to what people want to see. And so, uh, so for me, that's not a proper explanation. And uh, it also teaches us about It's also the false depiction of the, the of the 1950s and 60s, according to which these were the real uh, refugees, and the institution was doing its job properly, and everybody, or practically everybody, received the asylum. But it's a kind of an archetype of the image of the refugees, of the policies of yesteryear, uh, as opposed to those today. Yesterday, uh, like today. The political and economic motivations are always inter intertwined, and they have always been connected. And the distinction between the two has never been very clear, because the trajectories are always very complicated. But this idea of of the golden age of yesteryear was uh, it was built up a little bit gradually. Uh, the idea of the asylum seeker, which today, which is less political, uh, less political, uh, whereas we see this was the case yesterday as today, uh, it's this injunction saying that you must not mix up, this comes from the goodwill of people who want to help refugees. You mustn't mix the two things that have nothing to do with one another. If we mix them together, it's going to be to the detriment of the refugees. But you also have this saying, the saying, today's uh, borders have been, uh, have been upset by this new uh, uh, refugee policy. Uh, we have, to, in fact, to to fog up the uh, the distinction between the two, between the migrants and the refugees, but it's another way of looking at things. But we, but that is corresponds to the reality of the itineraries of the uh, uh, the immigrants. Thank you, Karen. You you talk about a lot of things in very little amount of time, and so I want to give some room to the discussion. And so I, I am pleased to talk about the. the for, for, I'm going to pose the first uh, or two first two questions to Karen. Uh, I want you to try to better understand the distinction between these these categories. Uh, in particular, the protection agencies in the 1950s and 60s. And also a uh, reflection of working on the institution itself, the OFPRA. It's particularly interesting for us at MSF because historically we have built uh, we have built a lot of programs around uh, the refugees, and also it helps us to come back to see to way that uh, certain organizations like Al Jazeera have have uh, have attacked the notion of uh, migrants. And the asylum seekers, as you said in your book, is the uh, the appearance of the uh, uh, asylum seekers. If there is a category which uh, is abused, not so much in MSF, but within greater society. And so I would encourage you to lead, uh, read this book, and also at least till the end of this uh, uh, emission to stay with us.
So uh, I have two questions I'd like to ask, and then we'll give we'll open the floor to everybody. The first being is, is just a question of curiosity. Did you did you present your book to the Oprah, and what was the reaction? Uh, uh, as a as a guard of the policies, uh, how did they react to, to uh, what they found in your book? And the second question. Uh, Uh, you explain very careful in your book and in certain uh, interviews that you've you've given uh, an asylum uh, an asylum situation uh, the 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 fudging of lines that you were talking about and so uh, after these two questions we'll open the floor up to our our listeners I didn't present my uh, present my book to the opera and I never will. Lofra invited me to come to present an article which I wrote about a scientific review at the, uh, about the moment of creating the Oprah, uh, because it's not a problem. It makes it possible to better understand the institution and certain things, what uh, people think about it, etc. But I came there to talk about the creation of Oprah, and I tried to go a little bit further and to dig into it a bit more. But it seems uh, almost normal that they don't invite me back. Because what I'm touching here is you're talking about their very existence. It's not, uh, it's not as if I came saying that they have the means of having better working conditions to better find the truth. Uh, what is a refugee and a, and a migrant? But in fact, that sort of goes uh, counter to the whole sense of the work. I'm thinking about this uh, productivity I was talking about, and we talked about the very critical agents, and the criticisms are accepted, and others are not accepted. When you criticize the working conditions, it's accepted, uh, because we haven't got enough means to be able to work properly, et cetera, et cetera. That's accepted. That's criticism which is well accepted. But it's, in fact, it's the very criticism of the foundation of working for, uh, for refugees uh, itself. And, but that is off the topic uh, to some, for some others. Uh, when we are asking questions, which questions which I was asking myself uh, uh, when I started thinking about it, uh, uh, man, I realized that I asked myself three kinds of questions, that one was very strong and two others which were inaudible and I barely dared to ask them, the first being, do we have the proper conditions to be able to find uh, the truth? And this opened up all kinds of works, a lot of things. What are the work good? What are the proper uh, working conditions? But at the time, that's what was most uh, audible. And after that, my second question came up. Uh, but the difference between refugee and a, and a migrant. And another question came up is that why do they uh, rank like that? And what, what's the fairness of this uh, grading? And I didn't know, I almost didn't dare ask that question to myself because I wrote the book. It's all, if I wrote the book, it's, it's a way to, for me, to everybody who's working like that today. And what I was missing was to think about all that. And that was about the, uh, the, second, uh, the second question which I wanted to answer. It's saying that there's no fair policy without uh, immigration policies, and that for several reasons. First of all, uh, upstream, uh, on making a request for asylum, there's an immense hi hypocrisy because we prevent people from arriving, but once they get into the country, they are recognized as refugees at 80 percent earlier, but we try to uh, uh, set up obstacles for them as, uh, as much as we can. But to be able to have a fair uh, uh, asylum policy, we have to be able to better define the uh, nation itself, the territory itself. And then, then downstream, I've heard, I hope you've understood that what's interesting about the, uh, the, the, from the 50s to the 80s, there was a kind of porosity, a, a porousness, 
But uh, we we work asylum and uh, asylum to uh, reorient people to a certain down into into a certain channel rather than another. And because we can or we can orient them to other things than asking for a refu a ref a refugee status. And so, what is this solid difference between? Since this difference doesn't really exist between uh, a migrant and a refugee. There are populations that could turn more toward asylum because it seems more their way of getting into the country and getting out of the refugee stream. That is a break with the, with the governments of the countries and other uh, migrants for whom the term is too strong because they lose their passports. And I talked about, to a Greek woman. Uh, but she went through the. Uh, she she wanted to keep a Greek, uh, Greek, uh, Greek passport, so she didn't want to uh, ask to be a refugee. And so this process of refugee is kind of at a watershed between a, pu a public position and a subjectivity about what it means to be in exile. And it makes much more sense uh, that a refugee has to also uh, self define themselves. And thir 30 years of migratory policies. Uh, restrictive, uh, no longer allows for that. That's why it's very interesting they have profiles of the for, uh, former agents. Not only was the greater possibility of self-definition, but in, in within the institution itself, you have the spokespersons for these communities. For example, if we, if we take a distinction between social categories and social groups, a social group, which is a group like executives, for example, which uh, self-define themselves, and a social category is, is somebody which is defined from the from the exterior. And so you have social groups, more more or less, and today they become a category uh, completely uh, defined from the outside. And so there is a kind of porousness which reflects basically the fluidity of the categories themselves and how easy, uh, how easy they are to change. And so for me, the policy of, uh, of uh, asylum uh, has helped to depict it much better about the fluidity between the, category, the categories. So that's saying it, expressing it fairly quickly. Well, thank you very much. And uh, the, uh, the the refugee status requesters, Rony uh, Borman. But before Rony, if you want to ask a question, to uh, uh, you have a button to be able to raise your hand. And we can identify you to, uh, to allow you to ask your question. So, Rony, it's up to you. Well, meanwhile, uh, for while we're waiting for Rony, perhaps you can take up the question about the 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 appearance of the uh, the uh, asylum asylum seeker, which it seems uh, self-evident to me, up until the 1990s, the the word didn't exist, uh, an asylum seeker. They talked about clients, or we used other terms. What it reflects, this category reflects the, the extension of the time period, and also reflects, and above all, the, uh, this, the refugee status is re recognizable. Somebody is a refugee before asking for asylum, and they're recognized as, uh, as, uh, as requesters of, uh, for asylum. They even have rights once they are granted uh, 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 refugee status. You have retroactive rights that you're allowed. And this category comes from uh, put an end to the idea uh, of those who turn to the institution uh, is already a kind of uh, 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 an a priori. This makes it possible for the staff, for the agents, to move away from the status of refugee, even, symb uh, even symbolically. It's a category which is, begins, uh, start, we start hearing in the reports that come out of the 1990s from OFPRA uh, about the, uh, uh, the asylum seekers. This category is gradually 
uh, and the agents take care of uh, asylum seekers and uh, the refugees. And the, the, uh, new spaces were created for the asylum, se asylum seekers and the refugee uh, seekers. The attempt to distance this, uh, this status uh, it took on a whole kind of setup, which we don't really need it when we try to orient people in another direction, upstream of uh, asking for asylum, uh, to try and filter out the ones that are considered undesirable. Now, Roni apparently is now online. And so first of all, thank you, Karen, for your uh, presentation, which is very interesting. I have two short comments on MSF on the categories and our new public management. We are self full right in the middle of that. And we are playing with this new public management and we must get interested in, uh, on the international level and the distinction, uh, the distinction between categories of displaced persons uh, and the internal uh, uh, migrants, uh, these are people who have fled Kivu, for example, during the war, had never received any kind of categorization or never received aid, including from MSF, even though we were very much in that context. And then people benefited from this category. And we, we interiorize that deeply, and that's uh, these differences in categories, and this is, is applicable to new, uh, us as well. So I have a question and then a critical comment. So in 1951, with the uh, 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 Geneva Conventions, we, uh, and it, it was mostly applied to Europe, if I understand if I stand correctly. It was built in the Cold War context, and directly uh, the USSR, uh, which, which, uh, which refused to join the UNHCR. And so they had a policy right in the beginning that uh, incorporated the conflict east-west in, uh, in their conventions. And you confirm that that really was what happened. My, uh, isn't there kind of a principle of uh, choosing, uh, of uh, expression of uh, will by the state in this category, categorization? Uh, and is that a, is, can that be a legitimate uh, concern to have a certain control over its demographics and its composition? In other words, uh, the power, uh, decision-making uh, decision power, which enters into and doesn't enter into the country. Who enters in? Does your reasoning lead you to this uh, challenging of the principle of triage? Or are these triages which are completely outdated and uh, not only not, not to mention morally shocking? It's a difficult question, that, that, uh, but thank you for asking. There are several problems here. Uh, up until 1967, there was a clause uh, called the European Clause, but when it was considered uh, that there was an interest to apply it to non-Europeans, like the uh, Viet uh, Vietnamians, uh, the, the, the Laotians, and, and uh, Vietnamese, this uh, was uh, greeted with open arms in France, uh, and so we, we went to look for the boat people to bring them back to France. They were welcomed with open arms. Uh, but during this, in the same text, we could open up when we wanted to open up. Uh, so this issue of, of uh, the reason of state is legitimate. For me, there are two things. I can answer afterwards, uh, do the immigration uh, policies are legitimate? Are they legitimate to have them? And so I'm going to come back to that. And so in the end, we are an institution after all. And if that's the object, we're not, uh, we're not, we're not doing as if uh, somebody has an intrinsic right to come into the country or not. For me, it's important to deconstruct this idea, 
Because we're fairly open. We have, tell, we have we've incorporated that so much at MSF, as you say yourself, and it's still very valid. And uh, I applied that logic. So that's the first thing. If this pol if you have to put a name on this policy, is it a descriptive policy in the life? It has to be able to uh, to, to, to assume its part. We, it has to it has to be said, but it hasn't been said. After that, the major question is the restrictive immigration policy. Uh, if the are the immigration policies restrictive? But what I can say, we researchers, what is fascinates us is like. Today, this uh, policy of restriction of, of immigration, the, co the consensus, uh, you have an economic demographic uh, problem. It has nothing to do with what we are producing in research, and which shows us to what degree could the economists uh, is uh, they there is no there they, they are not examining uh, unemployment things like that as a researcher there is no truth but very far from a uh, consensus that uh, immigration is a problem and, and there but because otherwise there are, uh, the, the the researchers have to question uh, challenge themselves and there's not at all there's no public policies and it's evident that it's electoral choosing behind the political choices of immigration. But the fact it's fairly naive to think in those terms. And But after that, I can't take the time to talk about why there is, uh, why people aren't examining uh, unemployment among that, because it increases uh, public money and doesn't, and doesn't create the public deficits. And why restrictive policies are more costly than than receiving immigrants is a whole different subject, and we could talk about it, but it's another topic. We'll meet again for a second volume of your book. My apologies in advance to a quite number of attendees because there are many, many questions. So three questions to start with. The first from Mary, and I'll read it. You've talked about uh, neoliberal policies of the OFPRA management, but it seemed that the financial cost of acceptance of a migrant in France is far lower than the cost of rejecting uh, and uh, evicting these migrants. And then the second question, could you please broaden the scope and talk about the role of HCR and its influence in the debate? So very different questions. The third question from Laurent. Your presentation is very interesting. You've talked about the uh, OFPRA workers who have this management approach and um, the uh, control and supervision. And how uh, is OFPRA itself being controlled and supervised? And we'll stop here. So. Regarding OFPRA, there is a board of directors made of the main ministries in France, the departments, uh, so those that have a weight on that, uh, so uh, foreign affairs, home office. And for a long time, OFPRA was uh, reporting to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and now it reports to the Ministry of Home Affairs. And at one point, there was a ministry of uh, national identity, and um, it was reporting to this ministry. So what I've just explained and tried to demonstrate shows that there's really, there was this uh, diplomatic policy approach, which is now that of reducing the number of migrants, and that's the reason why uh, OFPRA is not uh, independent. As an agency, it reports to ministries that are represented at the board and who try to set the tone uh, of their of pra policies. But of course, the various ministries do not have the same concerns. 
so there can be some conflicts. But today, we are at a time when the Ministry of Home Affairs is powerful at the Board of Directors, aiming at reducing the uh, flow of migrants. Now, the role of HCR in this debate, which debate, I don't know, but here again, HCR is a guarant or warrant of this uh, status. HCR is also an international organization funded by uh, governments and uh, here again, it sets the uh, tone, you know, funders and uh, donors are uh, setting the tone. And that's the raison d'etre of HCR, just like OFPRA, that is, saying that there are differences between these groups of people and that the refugees should be welcomed, and that they are more legitimate, etc. And then, as to the cost, and that's uh, the end of my debate with uh, Rooney Broman. Well, indeed, we should be aware of figures, you know, no figures are just like maps. You think that they're objective, they're not objective. There are many other uh, counterfacts that could be uh, uh, given. So figures are used to, to simplify a situation, but it's difficult to say whether an open, uh, an open to migration policy is uh, more expensive or less expensive than a, a restrictive uh, policy. We have little data, difficult to know, just like we always talk about migrant, uh, migration flows without talking about the balance. So there is a lack of data. I am convinced that if we have such a migration policy in France today, it's not because it is uh, cheaper uh, or less expensive for the state and government, but it's because we are stuck in this uh, auctioning system on uh, uh, foreigners who are scapegoats. It's quite often like this when in a crisis situation, when things go wrong, uh, it's easy to blame those who do not vote and who do not represent the nation. So today and for the last 30 years, it's not possible for the mainstream political parties to um, distance themselves from this debate. Uh, it's a bit of a, a, a quick answer, I'm sorry, but uh, there are other questions maybe and comments. A question on OFPRA, and I will add to that question. According to you, what would be the solution to change the organization at OFPRA, the way it works? And today, I'm wondering about the place of OFPRA in the French institutions. There are funny uh, sections in your book on how OFPRA is considered regarding the uh, uh, condition of the buildings, uh, what is the view of the director of OFPRA on the institution that he or she is running. because you were talking about uh, maybe changing the way it works and uh, the fact that the way uh, of prior works has changed and Cecile is also our king. What about uh, the uh, exiled uh, word uh, adding to the difference between uh, uh, migrants and refugees? Maybe you can also comment. What about uh, the protection rate as 37%? You've only talked about uh, OFPRA, uh, but uh, the protection rate is much higher because of the appeals court, uh, CNDA. Uh, economic violence, but what there are also reports saying that those who leave uh, are not the poorest one in their home country. So poverty as a reason to leave one's country, is it so true or not? 
a solution. Of course, I do not have any solution, but I have no solution to uh, suggest any uh, reform of OFPRA. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need better working conditions, but it's truly about a re reviewing these categories and this fiction of categories. And once we're out of this fiction, we can think of a solution, but it's so self-evident today that there is such a difference between two that it's difficult to uh, get out of this dichotomy. And I don't think that you can have a fair uh, policy without an open uh, migration policy. So it's well beyond of press power and control. I know that my answer is not uh, satisfying, but uh, it, the, it's the whole policy uh, migration has to be completely reviewed. For the last 30 years, this idea that migration is a problem is has been constructed, but there are many, many, many things to be said about it. A lot of research uh, does deconstruct each and every argument stating that migration is a problem. Then. The history of OFPRA is uh, the fact that it has been made more noble, just like the refugee status is a noble status, uh, more uh, noble than having uh, rights to work, even though those rights are the same, whether you are a migrant and you've been granted a work permit or uh, you're a refugee. We've had the status of refugee is uh, stronger. You have a 10-year residence permit, while for many years it was only three years. So, And that's demonstrated in the book. It's also a question of uh, the law. The law has uh, uh, defined various categories, and it's always uh, not reflecting the history, the individual history of people, but rather uh, the legal decisions which were made and that have defined these categories. And OFPRA is within this trend. Uh, for a long time, OFPRA was uh, in the backyard. You know, the first 15 years, the general directors didn't want to work there. Uh, they were the lowest rank in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, they were uh, they had been diplomat in second hand as uh, in the sec you know second ranking remote countries. Nobody cared about the workers at Ofpra who were all foreigners, and gradually the organization, uh, you know. Um, had higher standards, the budget of OFPRA in 1990 was multiplied by three. Not since then, it has been multiplied with more workers, civil servants, and I've called it from the consulate of refugees to the administration of asylum seekers as a shortcut to say, to reflect the fact that it has become a public administration body. And that's in line with what I said earlier about the uh, paradox of the noble uh, refugee status, so-called, which is a, a, a tool serving for the destruction of this uh, uh, image. So by further developing this uh, refugee status and by having a strong uh, agency to defend it, to protect the refugee, by having this idea that we protect uh, asylum by limiting it, which is not so true. Uh, one of the ideas is that asylum today, and that's one of the questions I'm asking, is the so-called humanist caution of restrictive migration policies. So they are fighting economic migrants, uh, depriving them of any legitimacy, and uh, being a refugee is like a rare resource with a very complex uh, system, very expensive uh, to be protected. So in my view, this is the kind of paradox that needs to be 
this is the the paradox that needs to be challenged and that's what i wanted to echo you know the um this uh, competition between control and uh fraud no exiled people is what actually reflects the identity of those people better than any other word and it helps to escape the dichotomy between refugee versus migrant what is interesting is to try and uh, leave behind these two categories uh, growing up is uh, developing a migration policy and uh, saying is uh, um, you know walking the talk is really uh, finding the right word to define, to describe a reality because uh, we have to use other words and other categories. As uh, what Rooney said, if they're not IDPs, uh, they do not enjoy any status, etc. And for the CNDA, that is the appeals court, it raises the rate of those who are granted refugee status I've mainly talked about the 1950s to the 1990s, and at that time, uh, the uh, rate of um, refugees who were granted status uh, was not that high. Uh, violence. So somebody asked a question about violence. What was it? I don't remember it. Michael has repeated it without speaking in the microphone. Or the comment was that research and reports have shown that it's not out of poverty that people are leaving their country. They are not the poorest, the one who uh, migrate. It's true, it's true. It's not the poorest in the poorest countries who are uh, running away from their countries. But it's also a question of legitimacy. The status of refugee exists based on an opposition uh, that is the refugee versus the economic migrant a migrant on economic grounds. So it's a, like a, a reversed mirror, if you wish. So the further remotest opposite image of the refugee is the economic migrant. If you ask me, I think that we could have a far more open policy for migrants. I'm also a member of Migros Europe group, we are preparing an atlas on the freedom of circulation, and we're saying that with this issue, it's either uh, a scarecrow or it's uh, said as an obvious uh, solution for freedom of circulation, but it's not so true. You have to think about it and work on it. We're working on it. We're going to produce an atlas which will be uh, published by Armand Collin on this and stop saying it's uh, either one or the other. I think that there's truly a need to uh, think uh, thoroughly about that and uh, the economic migrant is the least legitimate status that we have uh, said we say already climate refugees or environmental refugees is already a new form of legitimacy even though it's not enforced in international law so why a hunger refugee who's been here for a longer time is the orphan of all these categories so it's interesting to try and understand and think about uh, those, uh, uh, this uh, economic and social violence, which uh, are abuses that can uh, 
also be inflicted on people. And it is at the lowest level in the scale of legitimacy. So there is a kind of a hierarchy in our uh, liberal economies. Um, another question which will uh, result in more didactic answers. Is the same uh, is the refugee status depending on the country where you come from? From Veronique, in your home country, those people are who are living are uh, are they considered a migrant or refugees? And a third question: Do we know about the share or the rates of people who have received a, d a deportation or an obligation to go back to their home country? Uh, what is the percentage for this last question? I really don't know, says Karen. Maybe somebody knows. Maybe somebody in the attendance knows about that. Well, yes. In France, the refugee status does not depend on your country of origin. There is a the subsidiary protection for one year, which is renewed uh, every year, and quite often some countries are more represented or some nationalities are more represented uh, amongst those who will be enjoying the uh, subsidiary protection as opposed to those who are granted a refugee status. Now, a refugee status uh, is regardless of your home country. It's just that you have to give evidence of the fact that you've been the victim of a persecution, which is not an easy thing to do, as you've understood. A question on economic migrants? Is their status determined by the country they leave? Well, the status is not determined by the country where uh, that you've uh, fled uh, in some uh, nationals of some given countries have a little likelihood of being granted a status at one time it was for ideological reasons for diplomatic reasons When, pe when once people have left and have the refugee status in France, are they considered as refugee from their home country? That's a difficult question. Once you've left, is your home country considering you as a migrant or as a refugee? How are you perceived? depending on the status you enjoy in the uh, residence country. You, you are not considered as a refugee from your home country because it's a positive term. You are considered as a fraud, for instance. And so uh, we have uh, somebody sent us a, a response to one of the questions. Really, in 20, 2016 in France, uh, there were uh, there were uh, 24,000 uh, measures, uh, uh, and and tw and, and 24,000 were pla uh, placed in retention. And if we talk about the the policies of retention, so thank you, Denis. A more social based questions, more on social aspect, because then we'll have to close our session. And I read the question, don't you think that the fact that uh, migration is considered as a problem today is also due to the problem of assimilation in France? Second question, you've uh, talked a lot about the policies and the political decisions which were driving the uh, definition of a status. But what does it reflect regarding the social uh, context? Uh, 
Does that reflect also a rise in racism? What does that tell us about the social context, this uh, policies on migration and refugees? These uh, uh, more stringent categories today are resulting from a political decision. And doesn't that also uh, result from a, a, a social context? The choice to have a policy will have an influence on this situation, on these definitions. And then depending on the time remaining, I might take another question. These are two difficult questions. I'm not sure I'd be able to answer those questions. What the, uh, the link with the social context? Well, uh, social context is a very broad term. You know, if I, I could uh, give you a, a kind of answer of the cuff like this, but I'd rather talk about what I have investigated. What I've tried to say is that in the 1980s, Uh, there was this construction that the welfare state uh, is uh, expensive and that citizens do not trust the welfare state um, anymore. And the uh, welfare state or état providence in French was even a negative, had a negative connotation where uh, citizens had a child-to-parent relation with the government or with the state. And this came rather late at a time when the relevance of the welfare state as we know it in France was being challenged and there were uh, schools of thoughts in the French uh, civil servants to um, say that uh, we had to spend less money on uh, welfare, etc. And if you consider the case of Ofpra and Vincent Dubois, a researcher who's worked on uh, the uh, social benefit schemes and uh, unemployed people, so uh, we talk about job seekers and no longer about um, an unemployed people. We talk about job seekers, just like we talk about asylum seekers. And this uh, uh, budget uh, austerity uh, also implied a legal austerity. So the criteria to meet the uh, categories whether you are a job seeker or an asylum seeker, were just as demanding. Uh, you know, you have to demonstrate that you're in single mother to get some uh, benefits, etc. You know, so it started at OFPRA and the new managerial, new management policies that I've tried to describe also started at OFPRA. It's one of the first uh, state agencies where it was implemented. No surprise, because these uh, uh, agencies dealing with foreigners are just like uh, experimental laboratories. And at the time, OFPRA was a weak organization, didn't have any weight. But then the general directors of OFPRA later in the 1990s and early years of the 2000 were from uh, the uh, high education uh, institutions like ENA, for instance, which was not the case before. Now, I would like to, uh, you know, really identify what is the link. And what I think is interesting when you uh, work on history is that at each group of people, when they arrived, uh, for many of them, they were considered as a, a group that would have some difficulties in uh, 
assimilate itself in the French population. And all the statements we hear today about Muslim people, people from Africa, that they are far and remote from our culture. But at the end of the 19th century, in early 20th century, when the Italians and the Spaniards uh, arrived in France, it was said that they were uh, of a different culture and that uh, they would be difficult for them because they were Catholics. And it was at the time when France became secular and that uh, their, uh, their, their connections with our culture was, uh, were very weak as opposed to people who were coming from the French colonies. So I'm not saying that uh, ones are better or higher than others. It's just to uh, have a big of uh, hindsight. Uh, there were programs against the Italians in French. There were terrible billboards on the doors of bars and cafes. So the Belgians are uh, stealing our work. Uh, so when you talk about assimilation, cultural differences over the long time, we have, uh, we can uh, have a more peaceful discussion about the topic, right? So two final questions before uh, wrapping up. To come to my two final questions, which are very interesting. The first, what do you think about the relationship with the NGOs and the public powers in managing the uh, immigration uh, issue, which obviously has a direct, uh, a direct influence on us? And the second question, to come back to the topic of the book, how can exiles show that they are persecuted to be able to obtain the refugee status in, in real terms? When somebody arrives in France, how can they prove that they, in fact, have been persecuted uh, in their home countries? And so uh, what, uh, what role does uh, evidence have to show? The, the, the questions we are, are reining in, so I have a hard time uh, answering the question. For concerning the first question, it's, it's not easy to answer. The, the NGOs have, have and what their link is with the state because it's a vast field. There are many different ways to position oneself. And uh, you have the, uh, you are led by an economic reasons. And the, the space for criticism is vast, that is, depending on the uh, job markets and the spaces, which are g getting smaller and smaller. And with lower and lower costs uh, uh, on, on, in legal terms, there are some of these operators who enter into that uh, rationale, which is a kind of management reason, neoliberal, uh, uh, of delegating to operators who are working in a rationale of uh, capturing uh, shares of the market. Uh, you have organizations and associations which uh, are take, uh, take care of that, and they maintain a critical po uh, attitude toward the state about the refugees and the asylum seekers who differentiate because there's, there's a broad range, in fact, but it's very difficult to be able to give a precise answer uh, to that uh, about the, the relationship between uh, NGOs and the, and the states. And so there is a range of things to be able to distinguish between the NGOs and the, uh, the state. And to obtain refugee status, Today, first of all, you have to show that you have been individually persecuted. We're going to individually. Uh, it's not because we belong to a larger group. 
like the Kurds uh, uh, who have fled Turkey. So except for a few exceptions, certain groups are considered as, as particularly, particularly in danger. Uh, because they belong to a group. But that's a fairly rare occurrence nowadays. That means that today there has to be, you have to, you have to roll out an arg uh, ar a, a set of arguments which are complicated to show the links of cause and effect about the things that we've done and the things that have happened to us. You have to, you have to create an account, a, a chronological account, which is consistent. And this requires a certain number of skills, which explains why, for example, the people who are housed in the centers of uh, asylum seekers have a better chance of obtaining refugee status because they are advised uh, in the reception centers. And so they have to make stories that uh, talk about yourself and about your experience. And so you have to understand what their expectations are, which means that often people who come from the middle or upper classes are rather preferred because they have more of the capacity to be able to explain their stories and to prove their persecution. And so the understanding of they have better understand the ex expectations of the administration, but again, it depends on countries, and that's why it's very difficult to get into to this too much in detail. But what is interesting is kind of a contradiction. Uh, this uh, self this self account that you have to give you first you have to have to tell something which is which which is a very expected form. But at the same time, you have to be as spontaneous as possible, as if they hadn't worked on it. And that's kind of a difficulty in, in the pathways between telling the story, the, the most expected form of the presentation, but still maintain a certain spontaneity to be able to convince the legal authorities. And so with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the ever more restrictive uh, criteria for a person getting in, it's, it makes it very difficult, to, uh, make it difficult to, to play the right role. And so thank you very much. I'm so afraid we weren't able to get to all our questions. So, and I know this hasn't been an, an easy exercise. But uh, I'm not going to try and make a conclusion, a kind of resume, uh, a summary. But I would urge you very sincerely to read uh, Karen's book, uh, published by La Découverte, and to come back to what Karen said uh, this evening with uh, much more detail in the book about what we talked about tonight. And so thank you very much for having come. And we were, there were many of us this evening, and I'm grateful for your attendance and for asking the questions which you have. I'm convinced that the debate will continue, so uh, thank you very much again, and have a good evening. But I'm very happy to have come because MSF, I think, is an admirable institution, and I, I, and I find it, uh, and I have a great affection for it. And so thank you very much for having included me in your discussions. So thank you very much, and have a good evening, everyone. Over and out. <laughs>